Thanks so much. Thanks for hosting me, Elliot Bay. It's, I'm a huge fan of the store. I came here so many times in the research uh, for my previous book, which was set in Seattle in large part. And each time I would fill up uh, one of those punch cards where if you <laughs> spend like $2,000, you get like a free book. Uh, and that was great. Uh, that was my, my second leading source of income uh, for several years. It was my free book from Elliott Bay every once in a while. Um, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be able to speak with you today. So um, before I leap into uh, our topic, I guess I just want to get a sense of who's in the room. I won't probe too deeply, so don't, don't worry. You won't be interrogated, but just a sort of show of hands. Uh, could you raise your hand if you're in security, if you know what I mean? Okay, we've got one, two, three. So that means there's six people in security here. Three have admitted it. Um, could you uh, tell me if you're on the other end, if you, if you've, uh, you or your business have been hacked? Uh, just could you show, raise your hand? Okay, we've got about three. So three know it. Uh, three more know it and don't admit it. Uh, and the rest of you will find out, uh, you know, about 18 months after the breach, if the average holds. So, um, should be about half of us, I'm guessing. Uh, could you raise your hand if you have ever been targeted uh, by uh, a hacker in some way? Okay. So that was about half the hands. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, just to make sure the other half, have you ever gotten an email from someone that wasn't the person <laughs> that they said they were? And there was like a link maybe that if you clicked on it, because that is targeting you. Um, have you ever got a call, as I did this Monday, from the help desk? <laughs> but maybe it wasn't the help desk, because maybe I don't work anywhere. Uh, so, uh, you know, as well as face-to-face, -face, and we'll talk about that too. But those are all examples of how we're targeted. And the institutions that we rely on are targeted too. Um, and, you know, just kind of keep that in mind as we sort of talk about what we know and what we don't know about hackers and hacking. And that was some of what motivated me to write this book. So, um, Breaking and Entering is the true story of a female hacker called Alien and the birth of our information insecurity age. And I should make clear from the onset that Alien is what they call a white hat hacker, which means she's a good guy. Uh, big businesses and government agencies hire her or her company to try to break into them to see how they can be broken into. Uh, and that can be, take a variety of formats. We'll talk about that as we go on. And, or there's situations where they've already been broken into by the black hat hackers. <laughs> and um, in those cases, she and her team will come in, try to identify what got taken, how and why, and sort of trace the bad guys if they can, at least trace if there was a breach and what was taken, how to patch those holes, how to do recovery. There's also a, there's lots of subfields within this too. They'll do like digital hostage negotiation. Say you have a ransomware case at your school, your hospital, your law firm, your company, and you need to get the information back to continue operating. Uh, but you're not sure if you should pay $150,000 in Bitcoin in the next 24 hours. And even if you are sure you should, you don't know how to get $150,000 in Bitcoin in the next 24 hours. And even if you do, you're still scared that you won't get proof of life of your data. You know, will you actually get it back? And if you get it back, how do you know it won't just happen again the next day? So they kind of do some hand-holding there and a variety of other kind of consulting. So um, when I tell people a hacker can be a good guy, that's new information to a lot of people. Not to some, but to just to, uh, to many. And I think that speaks to this interesting disconnect we have, where all of us are now aware of hackers and hacking. We know that it is impacting our economy, our uh, cultural communications, our society, our politics. 
Uh, but if we ask, and all that we know, if we think about it a little bit, that we're being targeted every day by hackers, even on an individual basis. But if you ask someone to picture what a hacker looks like, we don't have a face. Uh, so I think there's that gap, which is part of what I'm trying to close in this book. So who hackers really are, how hacking really works. So what is our current sort of state of knowledge? Uh, well, if you do an image search for hacker, uh, <laughs> here's what you get. You get literally no faces, even online. It's kind of amazing, right? You get shadowed figures in hoodies or uh, figures wearing Guy Fox masks also in hoodies, okay? Uh, but don't worry if we go past the third Top three, I'm sure, no, no, no. Yeah, it just is hundreds and hundreds. You know, you can just kind of go on forever and you never get to a person, which is weird. How is this happening and it's so pervasive and so important uh, if there's no people on the other end? So um, I started in a pretty similar state. I had some ex computer knowledge, some hacking experience as a teenager but nothing too deep in the field in the last 20, 25 years as this has gone from a skateboarding-like subculture to a giant industry. And so I thought, usually when someone gives a talk, they tell you all the things that you, they know. That's a traditional talk format. Not all the things they know, but some things they know. Uh, and I thought I would kind of flip that and I would uh, tell you 10 things I didn't know about hacking before I started writing this book. And you can kind of keep score for yourself and you can see how much smarter than I was or if you're in the same boat or what you knew and what you didn't know. And we can talk more in the Q&A. So I did learn these things, uh, but it took time and it took experience and research and uh, a lot of help from Alien and her colleagues. So uh, let's just jump into it. Number one, Hacking has a history to it. It's not just related to our modern condition of a super network society. And it's not even uh, as old as computers. It's older than that. At MIT, where Alien went to college, hacking, the term hacking predates computers. It's over 100 years old. And it refers to physical exploration and these elaborate, extremely ingenious pranks not anything to do with computers. So um, this, for example, is one of the, the Great Dome on the MIT campus. And uh, this is uh, one of the, you know, this is MIT where she went, you know, just to kind of give you a sense of place. Then here's an example of a historical hack about 100 years ago. These are hackers at MIT getting a car onto the side of a building. Uh, that happens to be Alien's dorm, uh, you know, uh, 60, 70 years later. And so that tradition, you could see some continuity there. Um, you remember that dome a couple slides ago. Here it is with a police car on top of it, okay? That's one of the most famous hacks. Uh, another one is, uh, this is a complete sort of living room lounge set that is upside down on the arch outside the MIT Media Lab. I'll flip it over so you can see a little bit more. You can see the billiards table, the uh, easy chair, and I don't know if the lighting's good enough, but there's a cat in the easy chair. Uh, so, elite. Here is the tallest building on campus, transformed into a playable Tetris game. Um, and I actually was familiar with this tradition of hacking at MIT in the sense of pulling a hack, which is these elaborate, ingenious pranks. What I wasn't, what I hadn't thought about is what are the foundational skills you need in order to pull a hack like that? You don't just sort of nudge your buddy after dinner and say, hey, we should put a police car on the dome. Maybe you do, but you're not gonna pull it off right away, right? You need to be able to pick locks, sneak past guards, climb along ledges, go up a rooftop, disassemble, and assemble a car in the dark with a group of, because that's an extremely f visually prominent location if you're not doing this between you know, 3 and 5 a.m. And you need to, to do this with a core group of people that you can really trust 
with your life in some cases. If you're carrying 50 pound packs of car parts along a six, seven inch concrete ledge that's hundreds of feet above the ground. So that's going hack. Pulling a hack is when it's something people can see. Going hacking is just exploring to explore. And Alien fell into that scene, or you know, fell sometimes literally into that scene as a 17 year old freshman. And they would climb, crawl through steam tunnels. They would walk along ledges. They would climb up elevator shafts. They would hang from rooftops. And that was, they'd bring little uh, Sharpies with them. And they had a little signature, kind of like a graffiti mark. But a big difference between uh, your hacking sign-in and a graffiti is in hacking the ethos was no member of the public should ever be able to see where you signed in. It should only be places that other, only other hackers could get to, other inaccessible places. So it's very internal to that community. And obviously it was exciting to me because there's this direct analog to the computer hacking of getting into forbidden spaces, leaving your mark, especially in the early days before it turns to profit and power. Uh, so this is a view um, of sort of aliens part of campus when you know, uh, and it's a kind of hacker's view of campus. I was doing research and I tried to walk in her footsteps and those could be scary sometimes. And this is not a picture I took, but it is a perspective that I enjoyed. You know, I've been on that dome, I've been through those steam tunnels, I've peered up at least at the elevator shaft. I didn't dare quite go as far into spelunking as she did. Um, but you can see the sense of kind of ownership and power and fun and perspective if you're daring and skilled enough to do this. I um, talked, you know, the, the majors at MIT are numbered. Everything's numbered at MIT. Uh, and they're called course this, course that. So like, uh, I don't know, what's, what's like course six is computer science, is that right? What's like course 14, is that economics? Or I'm not sure, every, every major has its own, you know, number. And hacking is referred to as course 19. Uh, and course 19 is not in any official course catalog. There are numbers before it and numbers after it. But it's this kind of exploration. And you know, I was talking when I was doing the early research for the book, um, I was talking to a woman I met. And I said, oh, she said she went to MIT. And I said, oh, did you ever do course 19? And we were with a group of her work colleagues. And she said, no, I'm afraid of heights. And they were like, what, what is this major that <laughs> You can't do, but you know, this is the perspective. Uh, course 19, you know, you get up there and you flip around. And it's exhilarating and, and somewhat terrifying. So that's one thing I didn't know or hadn't thought about behind the going hacking behind pulling a hack. So uh, number two, uh, you know, hackers are more than hoodies. You know, how did uh, we've, again, here are our Google search results for hacker. So you'd think, how do you write a book about hackers? Do you start following everyone who has a hoodie uh, down alleyways until one of them logs into the dark web? Uh, and you're like, hey, I'd love to interview you. Uh, in my case, it was a little bit different. I met Alien by um, going to a preschool play date. And I was hanging out with my daughter. She was out with her daughter. I didn't know who she was at that point. We had met super briefly once, almost 15 years earlier. And we were kind of, it was kind of amazing. Wow, you've got kids. What are you up to these days? And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm the interesting one. I'm a writer, blah, 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 blah. And I talk about myself and my books for 10 minutes. And then to be polite, I say, what do you do? And she said, well, tomorrow morning, I have to break into a bank. And I realized, oh, I am not the interesting person in this conversation. Uh, and, you know, it really challenged my stereotypes to the degree I had one of a hacker. This is someone, you know, who had frozen dolls, uh, baby wipes, uh, station wagon, and people hired her for their own protection, right? The girl with the dragon tattoo has, has grown up uh, and has a mortgage and a minivan and uh, kids. And hacking has grown up as well. And that was a kind of wake up call for me. You know, the image to the degree we have one of hackers is 20, 30 years old and it's kids. It's like Matthew Broderick in War Games. That's 40 years old, right? It's Angelina Jolie in Hackers. That's 25 years old. 
So the idea of grown-ups are doing this and that the industry has grown up too was really exciting because I realized in following her story, I could follow the birth of this industry too. So on that note, hacking is now a big business. It's not just amateurs playing around for fun or for fame. The cybersecurity industry, when she got into it, was pretty teeny. Uh, it's called inf information security or infosec. Uh, and, you know, about 15 years ago, it was about a $3.5 billion industry. Today, it's about a $140 billion industry. And it's not just the size has gotten so much bigger. It's also that its importance has grown, too, because it's not just the size of the industry itself. It's an industry that has insight into every other aspect of our society. So uh, I kind of wanted to peer along their shoulders, not just to understand what they did and how, but what they knew about us that we don't know about ourselves, as well as what we don't know about them. So, you know, what does that mean from that, you know, 3.5 to $140 billion? It means Alien starts as a student playing around with computers as she gets into computer, from the physical hacking into computer hacking. Then she is a, you know, early employee. Then she is a manager of other people. And then today she's a CEO of a company with about 30 hackers under her wing that go around the country and around the world doing this kind of stuff. And that's happened on uh, both ends of the equation. There's both the white hats have grown up and professionalized and the black hats have as well. So just sort of being able to follow that path, because even when you see hacking or hackers in movies, whether it's legit, whether it's accurate or not, you don't see what happens a year later or five years later or 10 years later, how they grow up and mature and how their perspective changes. So that was exciting to be able to follow. And you can see, as I said, the bad guys have grown up too, right? Look at this. This is a ransomware uh, you know, screen and it's pretty sophisticated, right? It's like you had to have a user interface team involved in this. You have uh, uh, tech support. This has to be something that if grandma or grandpa get this problem, they can solve it, if you will. Um, and so it's got an FAQ, it's got a user-friendly thing, it's got how you can do payment, it's got the click to how to buy Bitcoins. Um, it's got about Bitcoin, it's got a how, a how to buy Bitcoin. Look at the bottom uh, left, There's a, they've got a great customer support, English language, tech support 24 seven uh, to help hold your hand. So you can give them the $500, $5,000, $500,000 um, to get your data back. So, you know, we look at this and it's just scary, but we don't think about what is the back office behind this in many cases? And it's, it's, it's sophisticated at this point. So, you know, you can see that there. And you can see you can even change your language from English to, to whatever else you need. Um, uh, uh, you know, the alien sometimes takes this uh, ransomware. She and her team, they... Uh, set off a kind of cordoned off computer, and what's called a virtual machine, to see how this software works. And other uh, cybersecurity operations do this too. And it's really hard to track where these hackers are, except you can see their usage patterns. When are they transferring the data? When are they active and corresponding with you? And you can kind of work back when it's nine, it's often this pattern of nine to five somewhere. Nine to five Moscow time, nine to five Beijing time, nine to five, Seattle time, uh, and you can kind of get a better sense there. And it's, it's kind of uncanny because you realize when you do that, these are hackers just like her, you know, dropping their kids off at daycare and then hurrying off to work. So it just sort of speaks to that maturation and professionalization of the industry. So number four that I did not know or hadn't thought about before getting into this topic, uh, computers are more than keyboards. I guess that should be pretty obvious, and it is, but it's not. So what do I mean by that? So we all know if it's a computer, it can be hacked. Uh, but everything is a computer now. And I think we know that to some degree intellectually, but following in someone's footsteps to see w the range of ways our life can be affected is 
more impactful, at least to me. So what is a computer that's not a computer, right? Your phone is a computer, obviously. Your car is a computer. Your supermarket checkout and you know is a computer. These are all examples of things that get hacked in the book. Uh, the, your security camera is a, is a computer. Uh, your smart fridge is a computer. Net, these are network computer. Your elevator, um, your airplane, and uh, maybe most sort of spine tingling for me in the research, uh, the average of 11 medical devices that are attached to a, a patient bed at a hospital. You know, all of those are probably network computers in some way. And those devices um, are built on top of off-the-shelf operating systems usually. So they're run in Windows or Unix or maybe Chrome these days. And they are very expensive. They are bought on a hospital time cycle for equipment. If you buy, you know, pay a million dollars for a piece of equipment, like a, a CT scanner or something like that, you're not buying a new one when there's a new operating system, right? You're buying it on a 15 to 20 year time scale. So that means today in 2019, when you go to the hospital, there's gonna be metal equipment that is modern medical equipment, but it's using a software operating system that has the sophistication and security of 2004. So I don't know if you remember the viruses and bugs and worms and stuff of 2004, but that's kind of a legacy you're inheriting just by being a patient in a hospital. There's a chapter in the book where Alien is working in security in a hospital system. And she is uh, alarmed because the, there is some machine in the hospital that has one of those worms that's sort of uh, infecting the machine itself and then trying to go to every other machine that is on the same network and it's shutting off traffic across the hospital and it's threatening the maintenance of machines. And in a hospital, data is life or death. If you don't have the, know who the patient is, if you don't know what their condition is, if a doctor or nurse cannot communicate across wards in the case of emergency, um, it's a, it's a life and death crisis. So the network is getting choked and she is running across the hospital trying to find the sort of origin point. What is this source machine that is sort of patient zero as a, on a machine level for spreading this worm? And she's running around. She gets to a room in the hospital that is filled with machines and is dark and is cool. And it reminds her and feels like perhaps even it is kind of version of a server room, like a data center, where you just store a bunch of machines for processing. She crawls on the floor with a mag light looking for the port in question, trying to find which is this machine that we're gonna have to pull or deal with in some other way to solve this problem, to stop the hospital system from freezing or collapsing. And she finds the machine, she stands up, and a nurse grabs her by the shoulder. And she says, turn that light off. And Alien freezes, and she has this just creepy sense of unease. She just thought, there's no patients in this room, are there? Uh, there's nothing you know, immediately at risk. And when she freezes, her eyes kind of gradually adjust in the dark. And she hears slow breathing around her. And as her eyes adjust, she realizes it looks like a server room in the dark, but in fact, it's the neonatal ICU. And there's these little babies attached to those computers and monitors beneath. And that, you know, we talk about everything as a computer, that could be, you know, the sort of incubator and life support system for a child in a hospital and was in that case. So, you know, stories like that, stories of a team, you know, tracing, you know, the things across supermarket systems to cars to elevators, you know, that kind of brings home to me how pervasive computers and network computing are these days in every aspect of our society. So you hear a story like that, and I wanted to go home and just like unplug everything, right? Um, but then there's this whole other world of hacking that has nothing to do with things that are plugged in, okay? Um, hacking is more than just computers, right? So there's all this physical kind of hacking you can do too, even on a security level. So, for example, here's a, a table of a bunch of lock pickers uh, just gathering, hanging out, having fun, picking locks. Uh, here is 
a tamper evident uh, table where you're trying to see, oh, can we steam envelopes so people can't tell if they've been opened or break into them other ways? Can we open pill bottles? Um, and that sounds very malicious, but again, these are trying to improve security by testing it. The idea is if we can do this, how secure was it? And you need to improve the security there. So, um, yeah, you can, uh, I'm trying to see all the little, yeah, the, the different modules they've got to play with there and the tools they've got from ultraviolet scanners to just table salt. <laughs> uh, looks like they've got some wax paper, sometimes the simplest tools can be the most successful. Um, and then there's this whole category of people that literally break and enter uh, in a sort of test security way. And those are called penetration testers or pen testers. And it is a, those can be remote pen testers, so they could be kind of working in your proverbial internet cafe or their own headquarters trying to break into computer systems remotely. But they can also be face-to-face -face people that are kind of getting into a building. And if they get into your building, uh, they can do a lot of things that you don't need computer, you know, uh, great sophistication to find out. Why break in your computer uh, when you can just open your file cabinets and read them once they're in? Why break in your computer uh, when you could just take your computer, <laughs> uh, you know, walk out with a laptop, walk out with the CEO's laptop, Send some email uh, from the CEO. Uh, is that a phishing email or not? You decide. Uh, if you or a customer file, right? Um, grab a key card. Uh, grab an ID badge. Just hanging on a desk, uh, hanging on someone's coat. Um, another great thing to do is bring a camera and just take pictures of people's passwords on Post-it notes <laughs> uh, on their keyboard. A uh, very low-key way, you know, leave only footprints, take only passwords. Um, and my favorite specialty of all, I talked to a colleague of, of Aliens who had, he was like, you know what, what I always did? I was like, what? I don't know if anybody, I'll, I'll let you guess in your own head because it's, it's just too clever. Uh, he was like, shred bins. Shred bins are the way to go. Think about it. He's like, they gather up all of their most sensitive and confidential information. Like, why bother going to the file cabinet? They've selected all of their most valuable, sensitive, private information that they want, you know, so sensitive they need it destroyed. Uh, and then they put it all in one place and they put it on wheels. <laughs> uh, and I was like, wow, don't, you know, you're able to just take those? He's like, I was like, did you ever get caught? He's like, yeah, once. The guard was like, stop. And he froze, and he kind of, you know, was ready to raise his hand. And the guard was like, that belongs in the service elevator. Uh, so, shred bins. So it made me, you know, when I go to my bank and I see they've got member shred day, bring in your documents, and when we've got a full shred bin, we'll just, uh, we'll deal with it. I'm, I'm a little more wary uh, than I used to be, for sure. Um, so, next. Um, how do you get into these places, right? It's one thing to say, oh, you pick a lock, you crawl through a window, and they do that a little, but usually it's a human being. And that was the sort of next revelation for me, was that humans are usually the point of weakness. Humans are hackable. Uh, and this kind of hacking has a specific name. It's called social engineering or human hacking. So social engineering, you are convincing people in some way to open their doors for you or give you the information you want. And you guys are all familiar with some forms of social engineering. Um, there's the email that's not from who, you know, it said it is. Here's the CEO, you know, saying I need 50, you know, we're in a crucial meeting, something's not transferring, you can just put $50,000 in this account so we can close this deal. You know, we think of these as being comically inept, like, I am a prince who is in exile, please send me this money. But in a targeted way, or in a slightly more sophisticated way, it often seems to come from someone who is very important to you about a topic that seems legitimate. And the money goes out uh, before the fraud is detected. Another example is, as I said, the help desk, or the sort of pop-up, uh-oh, call uh, you know, this number immediately uh, and have your credit card handy. You know, my, we were talking to a TV producer about a segment based on the book, 
And she was like, well, I would need an example. Does this ever happen? And my poor publicist was like, it happened to my mom yesterday. Um, and so, you know, it's real. It's happening. And it's happening on a daily basis. Uh, but there's also higher stakes uh, and potentially higher reward, which is face-to-face. -face. Um, it's can you get into these, not using email, not using a phone. And Alien's first day on the job as a penetration tester was one of those face-to-face -face jobs. It was one of the largest banks in the world, and it was getting into their corporate headquarters and trying to get out with whatever she could. So how do you get into uh, an executive's office in a big bank headquarters? What, what are the sophisticated tools you need? Well, she thought about it, and then she went to um, uh, Kinko's. And she uh, had her hotel room key that she already had from staying off-site. Uh, she had her own driver's license. And she uh, photocopied her photo from her driver's license and then pasted that on one side of the room key. She went and rented 15 minutes of computer time and uh, printed out the logo of uh, you know, some auditor group, bank auditor group. And she um, had a badge. It had her name. It had the auditor logo. It had a, a photo. Very legitimate. But you still need one more item to be the real authority figure. Uh, and I think, you know, if you're not sure what that is, you need $2 more to buy a clipboard. Because when you're a person with a clipboard, you're the one asking the questions, right? You come in with your clipboard and you're like, this is a spot check. I'm an auditor. We're going to do this quarterly. I need to see your security logs. Uh, you know, and she goes in. Handshake at the first bank branch she goes into. It was the corporate headquarters, and then it was a series of bank branches. So she, this is the bank branch. She goes in. Ten minutes later, she's behind the tellers. She's alone in the file room. They give her a photo while they're preparing a photocopy of the security log with any issues they've had. Ten minutes after that, she's in the vault. Okay. So she tried this again and again and again in a series of branches in the area. It worked every time. So... Uh, yeah, you need your driver's license, you need your hotel key, you need 30 minutes of Kinko's time, and you need a clipboard. Uh, and you need some moxie, of course, too. So um, that was really cool to me because it, I was like, wow, this is coming full circle. It's combining that physical sort of exploration from those early days at MIT and that kind of computer security work she'd done at the hospital uh, to be a penetration tester. So um, speeding toward the end. Um, you know, are hackers antisocial, right? So it's easy to think of hacking as the kind of ultimate antisocial activity. And we have this sort of image of uh, whatever, in Donald Trump's immortal words, the 400-year-old guy in his parents' basement, uh, maybe he's the one who broke into uh, the Democratic National Committee. Uh, but, um, you know, something, again, I wasn't aware of uh, was that there's this rich community that's grown up. Obviously, it was a small culture and a guarded culture when it was kind of against the law, and still is in parts. But it's also, as it's going bigger, the community has grown up too. So hackers have conventions. One of the biggest or most popular is actually happening right now, ShmooCon in Washington, DC. There was a whole group of Seattle hackers I was hoping to bring tonight to be able to answer some of those questions. And they're in DC, as it happens, the other Washington, as we call it here. Um, but um, they were kind of my guides, along with Alien, at uh, the biggest convention of all. Uh, and I went to a few, but the biggest are in Las Vegas. Uh, and 25,000 hackers, you know, come for a week in Vegas for a sort of three conventions that range from kind of professional to punk, uh, Black Hat, B-Sides, and DEF CON. And uh, here's DEF CON's logo. Anyone can go. You don't have to register. You don't, can't register with your name. You can't do anything in advance. You just show up. You pay cash. You use whatever name you want. And you're hanging out. Here's like one of the lines. You can see the, the sign for the biohacking village on the right. Uh, and yeah, here's people waiting to get in. And um, there's this 
community and there's this camaraderie and there's these friendships and relationships that have formed over time. So you go around, you see people hugging, uh, high-fiving, uh, hanging out, and just having fun. Uh, you'll notice, if you look closely, uh, her earrings, I believe, are lockpicks. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but you know, you, you meet, it's good to look twice. Uh, at just about anyone and everything at DEF CON. Just, just don't press too hard for real names. Uh, I'm not happy to talk in the Q&A if you want about how a reporter hangs out with hackers. Um, and so what do you do at a hacking conference? You hack stuff, right? Uh, but people really specialize here. So you can go and you find these communities that are devoted to any particular activity you might be interested in. So there's the car hacking area. There's the uh, Internet of Things hacking area where you can uh, play with uh, the, do the smart doll or the smart uh, doorbell. Um, there's the lock picking area we already talked about. And there's even the social engineering village where there's live contests where people go into sort of like a glass booth. They make live phone calls to like Verizon stores uh, to see how much information they can extract or if they can get employees to install things on their operating system uh, or reveal certain you know, intimate you know, professional or customer details and kind of give people just, just talking on the phone um, you know, access to, to important information. And I should note that I don't know what happened last year, but it, when I was there at three years running, um, a woman had been the one who won the social engineering competition. So um, again, it, it's interesting to see, see those niches. And it really freaked me out at first. Uh, but it became more interesting. And again, it's a form of we have to improve security by testing it. Maybe we'll have fun with it along the way. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and, you know, people have been going long enough that there are families. And there's a kid's area called Roots. And it's 8 to 16-year-old hackers. They, uh, you know, are taking apart chips. They're doing some code breaking. They're hanging out too. Um, this is the first activity, usually. They give these kids, like, a, a Chromebook or some other kind of laptop, and you are not allowed to turn it on. The first thing you do is you flip it over, you do this, take out the screws, and you take the whole thing apart. And you install whatever systems you want, you take control. Uh, and so it's fun to see, you know, eight-year-olds doing that. And they also teach them responsible bug disclosure. So if they find security flaws, how to report them, uh, and maybe get a bug bounty, and double your allowance. Uh, so that was eye-opening too. Not just that hackers are hanging out, but they're form friendships, families, and the next generation is there too. Uh, number eight, you know, again, those kids are being taught white hat sort of ethics. They're trying to teach, uh, and unless you have a community, it's really hard to teach ethical framework, right? So when hackers and hacking are in the shadows, uh, that's dangerous for all of us. We become ignorant of hackers, but they can be ignorant of some of their own possible bright sides. And so, you know, there are things that you can, you know, uh, buy more or less into depending on your skepticism. But, you know, there's the white hat sort of mantle that's self-proclaimed. Um, there's certification in uh, ethical hacking. Um, and, you know, at Alien's company, there's this banner, the pen tester's code of conduct that is enormous and hangs from the ceiling. And just to highlight a few items, uh, only hack when under signed contract. <laughs> you know, you are limited in your scope. You are working for your client. You are attacking them and you're being paid very well for that privilege. You don't go rogue and uh, hack uh, off, you know, whatever you're very specifically allowed to do. Once you become a professional penetration tester, it says you are held to higher standards of ethics parentheses, and liability, right? Um, and it also says uh, communicate, know your limitations. Uh, and, you know, at the very end, 
Treat all others with respect, including fellow team members, administrative personnel, clients, and enemies. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a fun, you know, just sort of realizing, oh, okay, this is a very young industry and they're having to develop, you know, new standards for how do you, how do you be a get bad guy while being a good guy? Uh, and it's interesting to see those constraints. And they're still very successful despite working with constraints, which is a little alarming too. And this code of conduct itself is modeled after a mural on the MIT campus that's sort of, again, pretty much accessible only to hackers. It's not publicly displayed. And this is the hacking ethics mural for, again, that sort of physical tradition of hacking. And you can, again, see some of the things. Be subtle. Leave no evidence that you were there. Leave things as you found them or better. Do not steal anything. Um, the thing about sign-ins, as I said, that they should not be seen by other people. Never hack alone. Know your limitations. Uh, share your knowledge and experience with others. And above all, exercise common sense. That was perhaps more observed in the breach in certain cases, but, you know, it's in, in the dramatic cases, but by and large, it's a 100-year tradition that has done amazingly daring things and surprising things, and, you know, it's kept things relatively safe considering how dangerous and daring uh, and ingenious the activities involved are. So uh, getting toward the end, Something Alien really insisted to me in writing the book. She said, once she agreed to cooperate with me, and again, we can talk more about what restraints I had or didn't have, she said, you cannot call me a computer genius, <laughs> okay? Uh, I am not a computer genius. That annoys me, okay? I worked my ass off <laughs> to be as good as this, and that's number nine. You know, at the professional level, hacking is hard work. It's not just sitting down at a keyboard and going, click, 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 we're in. Uh, or if it is, that's because you did a lot of click, click, clicking before that. One of my favorite subtle stories in the book is Alien had a boss at Los Alamos National Laboratory who said, you cannot work for me until you can do everything I need you to do without your hands ever leaving the keyboard. You need to learn every sort of keystroke combination in both the operating system and the command line, I mean in the command line and the programming languages we're going to be using. And that was this sort of Yoda-like training session that was really fun to write up. Uh, and, you know, it's the difference between sort of hunting and pecking and being able to play a computer or a keyboard like a musical instrument. And how do you get to Carnegie Hall? How do you break into an airline system? Uh, same thing. Practice, 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 right? So, you know, here's some of the command, you know, keystrokes for Emacs, her preferred text and programming environment. Uh, and here's a few more. 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 So, you know, this was the sort of preliminary experience that you're probably not gonna get even in a montage in a movie where it's like, okay, command M, C, L, D, R is how I hop around here. But it is the difference between, you know, for her between sort of conversancy and fluency and then mastery. And when she was then, after that job, put in a sort of hacking competition setting, trying to get this next level job as a penetration tester, she discovered she hadn't thought of herself as being special or having these skills, but she was able to leap past all these guys surrounding her in the class that were sort of stumbling and really, you know, play that computer like an extension of her body. So um, I should also say that level of rigor and preparation is behind the most successful hacking attacks too. Again, you don't just nudge your buddy at 10 p.m. and say, hey, we should uh, get into the Democratic National Committee. Uh, that also is a preparatory act. And on Alien's end, emulating or simulating the attacks of these black hats, you know, a lot of, almost all, not almost all, but like 90% of, of hacks do originate, that, you know, exploits come through often an email, business email source, clicking on a link that gives access to other things. And, you know, and her team, when they run those phishing operations, they're not just, oh, we'll just send an email and see if someone clicks. They have call scripts to follow up. 
that they vet and research over and over that they practice. They have practice sessions with the whole team going over operations and going over how to respond to every different kind of caller and scenario. And they have managers that are overseeing these people and making sure they're hitting their metrics and that they're following best practices in attacking people. And so do the other parties hacking for purposes we don't, can't say are good or bad necessarily all around the world, okay? So again, that hard work is, is going across and we should take that kind of level of adversary seriously. So to wrap up, what is a hacker then? And this is a question I get a lot now that I've written this book and it's one I still struggle with. But, you know, we know what it isn't or we know what it isn't only. It's, it's, it is people and so they do have faces, right? So what have we added so far? Uh, we've added history to hacking that you won't find in the search results yet. We've added uh, diversity. We've added maturity. We've added everything that's a computer that doesn't have a keyboard. We've added everything that isn't a computer that can still give access to our intimate information or threaten the security of our vital systems. There's human hacking. There's community. There's ethics. And there's hard work. And so when I think about a hacker, I now think of sort of the intersection of two things that we do understand better. An inventor is someone who creates something new. An engineer is someone who builds something to spec. And what's a hacker? A hacker is somebody who builds something new, creates something new out of something someone else built to spec, right? Uh, it's off-label uses for your buildings, for your computer systems, for your hospital, for your locks, um, or just about anything else. It's so fun traveling with hackers because you start seeing the world in a totally different way. It's like, oh, what would be fun to walk on in this ceiling? What is, is load-bearing? Uh, is there a hidden or recessed space? What does that open up to? What's behind that curtain? Uh, you know, I've been in like long lines in a hotel, and then suddenly we're cutting through a kitchen. We're up in the service elevator. We're going through the back door, and we're into the party, uh, you know, an hour before we would have been otherwise. They don't see the same obstacles we do. There's sort of that saying, like, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a hacker, everything looks like a door or a key. Uh, so there's someone, you know, another definition, another way to think about it, just putting a few ideas out there. There are people who break into things without actually breaking them. Or, you know, there's the sort of old engineer's uh, motto. They're improvisatory engineers, if that makes any sense. And, you know, there's a great T-shirt sold by MIT that says the engineer's motto, uh, which is, of course, if it isn't broken, take it apart and fix it. Uh, so that's kind of some of the hacking spirit that I think they embody. Um, thank you so much for coming out. I'd love to talk more about Alien Story, writing the book, any of your concerns or thoughts or ideas or experiences of hacking. Um, you can make contact with me, too, talk more and learn more about the book through my website, jeremynsmith.com. And last, um, I want to give a quick uh, example of this. Uh, one of the premier experts in lock picking in the world lives in Seattle. It's a guy named Deviant. He's at ShmooCon. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight. But I asked him to help design a, a hacker bookmark for the book. It's out of a special kind of uh, plastic on the front. It's that sort of thin plastic on the front. It's got the book cover. On the back, it says, this bookmark opens doors. And it's got instructions on how to use it uh, to get in a variety of uh, locks. So if you're locked out uh, of your room or your office, uh, it can help you get in. There's a cutout that you can use to, to pull open certain locks and other situations. And again, it's like, how do you turn a bookmark into a key? Uh, and We've got some of those at hand. I'll talk more about those after the Q&A to play with. And as it says, only open doors with explicit permission. Uh, so with great bookmarks comes great responsibility. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you guys for indulging me in talking about what I didn't know. Love to share what I do know or whatever you guys want to talk about. Thank you. Uh, what changes did you make in your day-to-day -day life as you were becoming more person? Right, like first I got crazier.
because I was following hackers around, right? So I was like, I need to ride a motorcycle across the New, the, the New Mexico desert because Alien did that. I need to go into Los Alamos and see how that works because she did. I need to go on top of the dome at MIT. I need to go to this DIY hacker shooting range with like drone driven skeet because that was an interest group at DEF CON with some of the people I was hanging out with. Um, and, you know, go through all sorts of other dorms and stuff at MIT and just see their weird and cool doings. But on a security level, you know, one of the, some of the things were, condi were conditions that she made before I started writing the book. Before I, most of our conversations were face to face, but I was still taking notes on others and other things. And she said, you need to do full disk encryption on your computer which is effortless. It's literally clicking a button. It doesn't change anything. Everybody just do that. If it means the computer gets taken or the hard drive gets taken out. I mean, her and her team are much, like when they travel, they literally like take the hard drive out of their computers before they like go to dinner. But um, for my purposes, she was just like encrypted. So it's not usable to other people. I got a set up encrypted email, which I hadn't done before. That's trickier because it only works if the other person has also set up encrypted email, but it's still pretty easy to do. So communicating with certain sources or with her on certain topics. Again, if people got that email, it's not readable to them other than the subject line. I stopped taking my phone in as many places. If I didn't need to make a phone call, I was like, oh yeah, if someone has an emergency, they should call 911, not me. Uh, and then I should get home and find out what happened. Uh, and you know, because you just start realizing when you follow these stories that you can be tracked. And you are being tracked. Not that you can be, you are. And there's a story about, you know, her team raiding, I mean, not raiding, you know, testing the security of a huge retailer that I'm pretty sure all of us in this room have shopped at. And they find the complete shopping, a database with the complete shopping history of every customer back into time. And it's like her first bra as a teenager to like her her, you know, the, the bassinet for her, her baby. And that's not hacking. That's just the company is keeping that data. Hackers can get into that data, but also it's creepy alone that the company has that. And every, it's not like unique to that retailer. It just made me realize, oh yeah, everyone knows everything. So maybe I pay for cash a little bit more than I would otherwise. Um, I'm of course much more wary in sort of certain, what information I put online and when I open emails, when I receive phone calls, things like that. Uh, at the same time, I have maybe a more positive vision of certain hackers because I've hung out with them and seen them as people and their community and kind of got a better sense that because they break into things, it doesn't mean they're malefactors. They may, in fact, be improving security. And they're certainly doing some fun exploring. And it's just cool to see people blaze their own paths. So the question was, we talked about the size of the white hat industry. What's the size of the black hat industry? Well, it's a lot bigger in part because state actors are black hats, right? I mean, the NSA, Chinese hackers, you know, those are people, are black hats in the sense they are not trying to improve security. They are breaking into stuff. I went to college with a woman who I talked to, was one of my early sources and technical editor for the book. And she was like, I, she's ex-NSA, and she's like, I'm a black hat hacker. You know, I'm working not to improve security, but to get into stuff and, and take control. And so if you think of it on that level, you think about like the budget of the NSA as one of your line items in your black hat hacker tool book, it's going to be huge. But even in just the sort of commercial criminal gang end of it, it's pretty big. There's a fun thing where she's talking to her COO, about sort of this criminal operation once they realize, oh my gosh, this is really professionally written. They've got these call centers. They've got this help desk. She's like, what do you think this, how big do you think, you know, they, how many people do they have? And her CEO is like, I don't know, but I, their sales team is definitely bigger than ours. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's that realization that this is a, an economic boom and it's, it's probably pretty big. And then there's this sort of middle ground of like cyber insurance, which is a giant, uh, a, a huge growing field in insurance. So um, you think about that industry for better or for worse, ideally they're improving practices because to get insurance uh, you need to do certain things well. I think of it kind of like, you know, 
every great city has burned to the ground many times because that's just what used to happen all the time because we didn't have fire departments. And then rich people started having private fire departments. And that's kind of where we are with hacking. And then uh, you had public fire departments built. And then after that, we were like, this is really annoying. Now we have public fire departments. We should probably have building codes. Uh, and that changed the standards. And we're really in the early days, if yet, for having building codes for security to sort of build security into the products. But we're more aware of it. And so these sort of next generation of products, some of them are really good in terms of security practices, even if maybe they're not like self-driving cars. They worry about that from the beginning. They haven't thought about that afterward. I'm not saying it's perfect, but um, they're probably safer than people. Uh, but then you have like your Internet of Things stuff, which is pretty disposable items that the connectivity is a feature, security is an afterthought. And those are really scary. Alien has this whole activity with her and her team where they just break into security cameras, not to steal and watch you, but just to use the processing power to mine Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, it gives you a sense of the unexpected uses of these 30 billion network devices we're going to have by 2020 because of all this EI IoT stuff. Yeah. Uh, Alexa and smart speakers, are they listening to everything we're saying and storing it in AI and all this and figuring out what we do and what we think? Don't ask me, just ask, ask Alexa. Uh, I, I don't know. I've talked to, um, you know, it, it's obviously a concern and it's in the news. They are obviously listening to everything, at least to hear if you're saying Alexa, and how well they're filtering, how secure it is, and whether intentionally or not, if that system can be breached. It's a computer, so it could be, but obviously Amazon, Google, um, have security teams and are, you know, Apple, they're working on, you know, it's, it's not an afterthought. Um, I spoke at Google yesterday and, uh, you know, they said, don't worry so much. Uh, but, uh, you know, I worry more. Uh, that's another change. You know, I don't just type things entirely into Google as my default just because I you know, I'm a little, I at least make it more of a choice. And I use a different, you know, sort of search engine as a default now that doesn't always give me the same depth of results, but works for 95 out of my 100 searches. And then at least I'm conscious of what I'm doing, that I'm just sort of putting things that are private or confidential or, you know, might be embarrassing or just creeped out if they're stored forever uh, into a magic box. And I know they're not disappearing. So. I guess I would definitely assume that if it wouldn't be okay for everyone to hear it, you maybe shouldn't say it to Alexa, but that's, that's at least where I am right now. But I know a lot of people have got it and they, that's just part of their life. So um, it'd be great to be more assured of that and it's hard to do when these things are not open source. Uh, yeah. What are some common things not to do? Don't click on that link. Uh, yeah, I mean, what not to do? I mean, I think I talked about some of those practices. I, you know, I think of it more in positive terms rather than negative terms. Um, so, you know, I said some of the things I'm trying to do, and I think ask for as consumers, you know, think about security and think about privacy and advocate for them. And privacy was a later thought for me. Security is so, I mean, I knew it was an issue throughout the book uh, and throughout the topic and even before I got into the topic, but security is so obviously essential. Like if the hospital doesn't work, if the power grid doesn't work, uh, if your bank doesn't work, that seems so pressing of the moment. The thing with privacy is you can't get it back. So, you know, if you lose your credit card or someone raids your bank, that's kind of okay because you can cancel it and the, your account is insured and you can get a new credit card. If someone steals your medical information, you can't cancel your medical history and get a new one, right? And so once that's out, it's out. And that's true of your where you've traveled, who you've talked to, what you've said. And so it's uh, more of a death by a thousand cuts rather than the bomb's gonna go off in 10 minutes. Uh, but it's something I think about more. So I don't think that was your question, but 
That's an answer to a question. So what are hackers worried about? I mean, I can't speak for all hackers, and I think it changes from person to person. And I think it also differs between amateurs and professional, because there still is a strong spirit of amateurism, and I mean that in a positive sense, uh, and industry types, right? So once you have a mortgage, you have got kids, you solve, you want the banking system to work, you know, you want uh, the transportation system to work. And it's this often this hinge point that people were reflecting, oh, I got to be about 30 and I wanted to, to figure out how to protect things instead of breaking them. Uh, but they're certainly much more guarded about what they call PII, publicly identifiable information. Uh, so often, you know, they don't want to say their name or their date of birth or certain things like that. And some of them are super high tech. They are geeks, right, too. They want to play with the newest stuff. And they figure, oh, I'll use my iPhone. You know, when I went to the hacker conference, I was told, don't bring your real phone. Don't, certainly don't bring your computer. And there's, certainly, there's like a wall uh, projected that's sort of a running tally of captured usernames and passwords from people going online, just normal tourists in Vegas sort of by the convention. At the same time, someone was like, just check, you know, don't use the inter don't use Wi-Fi, but like it's fine to check your email like with your phone via the phone thing because an exploit is now worth like a million dollars and they're not going to waste it reading your email. Uh, I don't know, right? Uh, but you get a range of views, so I guess that's a share of some of them. Well, I'm just curious about if you spoke to any of the black cats, their experience on their side. Yeah. You know, they just whether it's grandma or the hospital, stole information or ransomed it. That's the one I'm particularly interested in, the psychology of the social engineering of ransoming. And what it's like on the black cat side when the hospital refuses, grandma refuses, all the family photos are gone, or the hospital admin records are gone, and they're there. You know, did you get into that psychology on that side? Well, that's an interesting case. You know, it's not, I don't think there's like, oh, I'm looking at grandma's photos. It is, and I think that's something I want you to make clear. You know, few attacks are targeted. The Democratic National Committee is an example of a high value target. A CEO might be a high value target. Most hacks are opportunistic. It's literally just trying every door and seeing where you can get in, and then you wrap the data up. It's automated. It's not like you're investing yourself emotionally. And hacking itself has become, taken the example of Silicon Valley as a model, and it's like cloud-based hacking software suites. You don't have to know how to program. You don't have to own a computer. You log in, and you choose the hacks you want. You choose the target you want, and the hack starts running. And so uh, that's kind of scary. It's scary for Alien, too, because she's at least used to negotiating with professionals. If she's got to like tell someone how to you know, decrypt the file so they can get it back, that's just really annoying. Uh, when the amateurs are kind of shooting themselves in the foot, they don't know how to run their own software that they're using. So um, there's a little bit of that too. But, you know, again, think about the opportunities we have if we have technical skills in this country lawfully if we were in a different situation uh, or, again, we're sort of used to operating in the shadows and we have the culture and community that comes out of shadows uh, rather than the light, you're going to have, you know, different incentives. So... Can you speak to hospitals improving their security? And is there a code of conduct, even among the bad guys, to not attack hospitals and other kind of virtuous institutions that you'd be a pretty big jerk to attack, if I'm relatively paraphrasing? The thing, again, about hospitals is that they're not necessarily being targeted. It's, again, they're running systems that are vulnerable to these attacks, so they're just one of those doors that's being tried. So someone doesn't know, it's very, I don't believe that someone is targeting a neonatal ICU. It's that they're targeting anything and they're gone on a network and it eventually connects to that neonatal ICU machine and that machine is vulnerable and it becomes the source of the infection. There are some cases though, like ransomware, where that's a very high value target. It's a target that is extremely likely to pay and become, because otherwise, you know, a hospital cannot operate without that data. So ransomware happily has a relatively inexpensive remedy if you think about it in advance, which is backups. Uh, if you have a regular backup, you can restore. Just make sure your backup system cannot be ridden to after it's backed up. Otherwise, the, that'll get overridden and encrypted too. 
that's a real specific case. Now the question was, can hospitals also improve their security or should there be better standards for their equipment? You know, there are IT teams, obviously, and now information security teams that are part of hospitals. And ideally, they're part of the decision-making process when they're buying this kind of equipment. So when vendors sell certain connectivity as a feature, the Alexa-enabled CT scanner, right, uh, someone can be saying, can we use this? And can, you know, scarily enough, it can void the warranty to test this equipment sometimes. Only the manufacturer can. And the sort of adage is it's security by obscurity. Like if nobody knows about it or if it's running a weird operating system, maybe it'll be safe. And I don't think that's a very reliable kind of system. So, um, you know, as people, you know, build new equipment, as we have these concerns about hacking, I think that, you know, security is improving at least. And all the people I talked to studying medical device security, they could both tell these really alarming stories and they said, and also these devices are amazing, right? They are improving outcomes, they are saving lives. It's kind of like self-driving cars. They have a whole new set of problems, but that doesn't mean they don't make things safer in an outcome level for us than the world we're operating in now. Um, so uh, just to plug the bookmark, I've got signed bookmarks by me and Alien for anyone who gets more than one copy of the book. Whether you do that or not, there's also postcards that you can grab uh, and uh, at least play with the bookmarks because they're just fun to see. Uh, and you can kind of get a sense of how you can make one yourself if you needed to. Uh, so I think I'll be back there, if I'm not mistaken, and love to talk more one-on-one -on -one and meet you guys. So thanks so much.